Oh boy. All right. Well, this is round two of the announcements that uh, we've been trying to get out to everybody regarding these significant changes to the international student program. And I know you guys have been online. I know you've followed all of the comments, you know, all of the speculation, but today it's all about answering your Q and A's, at least this evening. I did a, um, I did a video earlier today where we talked about the specific details and we definitely will. I wish there was more that I could share with you right now, but once again, the government has in issued very little detail uh, about exactly how things are going to roll out. And as always, you guys, the devil is in the details. And so we'll see how it plays out. But right now, those of you who are wondering what this is all about, and if you've somehow been under a rock or somehow at work without access to your phone or whatever it might be, and this is a surprise to you, this is what we're dealing with right here. So Canada, Minister Miller, this uh, fine fellow right here, made this announcement today and he did it on YouTube. Uh, and it looks like he did it in his riding, I think. Um, but this, uh, this, this uh, live stream, you can check it out on CPAC right here. And uh, let's just drop the minister off. We've got a double minister here. Um, Canada announces two-year cap on international student visas. It wasn't just that, you guys. He also announced um, a huge, huge blow to people who are using the International Student Program as a pathway to permanent residence in Canada. Now, for those of you that are in here right now, the, the reality is you're probably not going to have too much of an issue because you're, for the most part, grandfathered in. But many of you, as we go through and, and pay, like, take a look closer at this, if you're not a master's or a, or a PhD student, then you're not going to be eligible for a postgrad work permit. So what does that mean? Practically speaking, what it means for many of you that are looking to come to Canada that maybe are thinking about using the international student program to get extra points, to be able to work in Canada, and then gain what you need to, to reach that high level for the rounds of invitations, it's not going to be there for you. So ultimately, when is this going to play out? How is it going to really change express entry? We'll get to that in a little bit. But it's going to be a couple of years before all the people that are already in Canada right now, the hundreds of thousands of, of uh, international students, like we've got a million right now that are working their way through the system. The government takes kind of three-year chunks. And so each year they, they issue about 300 and, I don't know, 300 and some thousand in change each year, new study permits. Um, but right now we're sitting at close to a million, if, if not over a million international students currently studying at all levels of um, – uh, of education across Canada. So we're going to have to wait to see you guys how this plays out. And those of you who have been outside Canada wondering if express entry is ever going to be a possibility for you based on this, although they've said it's, you know, only a two year pause. Mm, no, I'm not buying it. I think this is going to be something that's going to be extended out. And remember in the announcement that they provided here, they said they're going to reduce it to 360,000 for 2024, but they are, going to leave it open to see what happens in 2025 and they could very well reduce it even more. So what that means is as individuals work their way through the system that are already here, maybe in a couple of years, there will reach a stage where those comprehensive ranking system score points are going to come down to the point where an individual with human capital alone can potentially get an invitation to apply maybe through a general draw. And we're not even talking about those of you who speak French which you have a massive leg up, a massive leg up through the, you know, through the, uh, the bonus points that you get um, for speaking French. But it also, uh, you know, for individuals who maybe are not in one of the category based draws, you may still have an opportunity. And I've covered a lot of this in my course. I've got a special video just alone. Uh, I think it's lesson four in my over 60 some lesson express entry uh, 2024 accelerator program uh, that I just launched a few weeks ago. Um, I, I did a video just specifically on assessing, you know, various case studies. And one of them was an individual who in the past was a sure win to get an ITA before everything that's happened. You know, someone who has a master's degree, has three years of foreign work experience, is 29 years old or younger, and has at least a CLB9, well, you're sitting at 469 points. Well, will it ever come down to that? We will see. I see questions pumping in here. Absolutely, those of you who have showed up and are watching this live, um, this is all about, you know, questions and answers, uh, trying to sift through what the minister has really said 
look through the lines, between the lines, and dig out information. So we're planning on about an hour here. I didn't have enough time to address everyone's questions um, in the previous uh, video that I did earlier today at noon Mountain Time. So if you want to go back, you can watch that. I cover the details a little, you know, a lot more with the details. But today it's all about trying to get your questions answered. Uh, there are a few little outstanding things that I need to point out right off the bat. And um, as I got, as I went through and took notes and and looked at, you know, um, the the programs in 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 detail, at least what the information that we have. Um, one of the things I want to point out, and this was actually, I think Cedric, you, you guys remember Cedric, if you followed our our uh, our channel, he had mentioned in an email that he posted to one of the immigration lawyer associations. Um, he pointed out something that I hadn't really thought of in the previous video. Obviously, I just basically jumped on and started looking at it. But if we take a look at the actual instructions that IRCC has provided here for study permits, so this is on this how to apply for a study permit, and we jump down to get the, do the right documents, you will see here that as of January the 22nd, you now need an attestation letter. And for all intents and purposes, I think Quebec is the only province that's actually figured that out. So for all of you who are looking to apply, you basically can't. So you can't submit uh, a study permit application until the province you're destined to has figured out their process for issuing these attestation letters. And uh, this is implemented today. So effectively, it, it does put a bar on the ability to apply for a study permit until, and hopefully the provinces don't delay, I'm sure they won't, uh, the, the minister in his, um, in his present, you know, in his speech here that he gave, this news release, he indicated that they're going to give provinces until March, the end of March, to have their processes in place. But that doesn't help people who are looking to apply right now. And another thing I want to point out with this 360,000 cap for 2024, they're going to apportion these um, pro proportionately based on population for um, each province. And so one of the things I want to point out as well is that if you are looking to go to, say, Ontario, British Columbia, well, in both of those provinces, they have more as a percentage of the total population in the country, okay? Um, the Canadian Bureau for uh, International Education, and I want to give a shout out to Nicholas Kyung, and uh, he um, flipped around uh, an article in the Star really quickly to, you know, to share what was learned from from this, uh, this uh, you know, YouTube um launch this news release that Minister Miller did. And it kind of irritates me because usually we get, you guys will get a notification that the minister is going to do some announcement and something this big, they just quietly amongst the media released information. There was a lot of media that were present there. Uh, I think they got a lot of word that some big changes were going to be rolling out. We knew they were coming, but he didn't do a very good job of notifying anyone else. They wanted to keep it kind of quiet. So Shout out to Nicholas Kyung, who, um, yeah, once again, produced a, a really good um, a really good overview of what was said. But in that, uh, one of the statistics that they were able to provide was from the Canadian Bureau for International Education. And these are 2022 numbers, but, and, and then the population data was, uh, it looks like just from last year, the end of the year. But Ontario has 39% of the Canadian population, but yet they received 51% now of all international students, now 2023 numbers could be even more, but for 2022, they received 51% of all international students. So what does that mean? If you're going to Ontario, those numbers are going down. So of the, uh, as we look here, of the 360,000 total, well, we know that if, if 360,000, if 51% of these went to Ontario, well, I can tell you, Ontario is going to be 50% down from what they were before. And in fact, that's what Minister uh, Miller indicated. So uh, when you look at it, Ontario has 39% of the population in Canada, and they um, had 51% of international students. So a 50% decline is what's expected for Ontario. BC has 13.8% of the population, and they have 20% of the total international students going to British Columbia at least as of 2022. And once again, these numbers could be different in 2023. So Ontario and British Columbia can almost assuredly uh, expect to see reduced numbers. But provinces like Alberta, for instance, who has 11.7% of the, of the country's population, uh, they only have 5% students. So what does that mean? Some provinces are actually going to be winners with this. Um, it's likely that you know some of these provinces, when they divvy this up, 
the 360,000 that, that, you know, they are going to have more spots available um, for students to come study in their schools. So we'll see how this ultimately plays out. You guys, we will see how it plays out. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to point out. Um, like I said, with the attestations, another thing is that the spousal open work permits. Now, when you look at, they've also decided that they're going to um, limit the availability of spousal open work permits and, and to only um, PhD masters. And then they say in, in some kind of weird fashion, um, uh, let's just see here spousals. Yeah. I think it's just PhD and masters. And uh, interesting to note as well is that Canada is not the only country that's instituted these caps, right? I believe, I, I think one of my colleagues, um, I think it was maybe, Robert Leong out in BC indicated in one of the emails that I was reading as we were discussing this, that, that the UK has implemented a similar measure in, you know, in, on January the 1st. So many countries are starting to realize, hey, maybe this isn't so good that we have so many international students coming and we need to protect our education system, you know, uh, from these types of, you know, these kind of public, private kind of public colleges. I don't know how to describe it, but, but um you know, I, I don't want to pass any judgment on this because, I, you know, I, I've got my own feelings on whether this is good or bad. I got myself into trouble a couple of years ago when I was critical of some private colleges that, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not going to pass any formal um, judgment on this. At the end of the day, it just comes down to all of you guys and what you do now, right? And that's what we're going to get to with the questions. I also want to read one other thing here for Ontario. And this also comes from the Star article uh, by Nicholas Kyung. Um, according to Ontario's public accountants, revenue, okay, revenue from fees paid to the province's public colleges grew more than 1 billion last year, okay? From 3.4 billion in 2022 to 4.4 billion in 2023. The province's Auditor General has also warned that the freeze and reduction in tuition paid by Canadians at Ontario post secondary institutions appears to have contributed to universities becoming financially dependent on international student enrollment. And so what that means is that this is going to have some pretty massive impacts on many of the schools. And if there's only so many study permits that are going to be issued outside of the master's and PhD route for undergrads, even the public schools are going to suffer. And I have to assume that the public schools are going to get the lion's share of the allocations and it's up to the provinces to decide that. The federal government, IRCC, is going to say, this is how many you get, Alberta. Now you figure out how many are going to the University of, of Alberta, how many are going to the University of Lethbridge, University of Calgary, you know, Lethbridge College, uh, SAIT, Nate. You know, that's what's going to happen. And it's going to be very interesting to see how things are divvied out. So those were some of the high points I wanted to hit on just to provide context for this discussion. Now let's dive in and I want to hear what you guys have to say. I want to hear your opinion on this. I want it to know whether you feel like this is maybe, you know, a horrible thing, a good thing, a bad thing. Um, because at the end of the day, one of the things Minister Miller pointed out, he said that, um, uh, and I'm just going to highlight this. He said that they, they want to make sure that they're not rewarding these fly-by-night operations and backdoor institutions to Canada. And in fact, um, one of the things he identified in terms of bad actors is he said the people that don't have the best interests of Canada at heart who attempt to game the system. And he gave an example. He said, it's a bit of a mess, um, but it's time to rein it in and blunt measures are required. He said, uh, they don't know if they're going to get it right, but they also put blame on the provinces to do their part, essentially. And uh, they're authorized these fly-by-night schools and then he gives an example of a sham commerce degree uh, for a school sitting on uh, on top of a massage parlor that someone goes to and then drives a Uber, you know, basically Uber, sorry, who, who then ends up being an Uber driver. And he says, look, if you need a dedicated channel for Uber drivers, um, as a minister, I, I can create that, I can design that, but it isn't the intention of the international student program to, to facilitate that. So it's just, it's horrible. Um, yeah, it's just it's just crazy. So, all right, let's see what you guys have to say. So we got Anastasia here. Hey, good to see you, Anastasia. <laughs> it's good to see that you're connecting in here. Thanks for connecting in. Franklin, looking forward to getting clarification on this issue. Any questions you guys have, fire them off. Uh, Anastasia says, personally, I don't think the government handing the housing pro handled the housing problem right. Well, that's just one of the things that they've pointed to. 
is housing. They pointed to health care and other services that are also being taxed because of the large numbers of international students. But it's not just international students. Anyone who says that international students are, are not contributing to the challenges for housing um, is, is, is being dishonest, okay? Because they are. But the question is, to what extent are they? And I'll be honest, you know, when you look at, um, and I talked about this in previous videos, when you looked at all of the various mechanisms, mechanisms that the government has put in place to allow open work permits to come. So the Ukraine, Kuwait visas, Okay, those, those work permits that accompany it, um, those are all open work permits. And there were, I don't know, what do we have, 250? I don't know if we have 300,000, um, you know, actual uh, Ukraine citizens here in Canada. But you have that high number. You have, from Iran, we have uh, Hong Kong. We've got the Canada H-1B open work permit holders. How many of those 10,000 are coming? So, um, and then all of the, the refugee settlements, the steps that Canada has taken to really step up on, you know, internationally with our, uh, you know, our efforts to, to try to assist in the settlement of, of refugees from all over the world. All of those things play a role. And unlike our annual levels plans, which are set, you know, there's only so many permanent resident applications that are approved. So many people are landed as permanent residents. Well, that's fine. But even temporary people take up room and they uh, access the social services that are here. And for sure, they pay for it when they're working, right? And uh, so there, there are mechanisms in place to, to, to recoup costs, but the access and the ability to service and deliver, that's one of the things the minister was talking about. All right, let's keep going through here. Fernando, good to see you. Good evening. Um, Tay says, for students already in Canada that want to renew their study visa, would their spouse be allowed to get an open work permit? Um, if an individual is here already, I have to assume that, you know, and I'm only speculating here, that if a spouse has already obtained a spousal open work permit, I think it would be cruel for them to shut it down and say, no, you can't do another one. But if you have never applied for a spouse, even if you already have a study permit, well, they could open it up for you to be able to apply on an extension. But I would be very, very um, doubtful um, that, uh, you know, that, that they, that they would allow that. Um, I think they treat you just like any new student. Um, if your spouse wasn't already here, but anything can happen. Absolutely. Anything can happen. Okay. And, uh, and then Anastasia says banning spouses from coming together with a student is just a nice and polite way to say ban for all international students. Separating families is not a way. Well, Anastasia, I'll actually challenge you on that because the whole purpose of the international student program is temporary. And what's happened is, and the minister specifically addressed it, he said that there, there's, you know, it has become a backdoor institution, um, you know, for, for, uh, for, for coming to Canada for permanently. And so there's a definitely a balance between it. And I get it. Who would want to be away from your spouse if you're married? And what it's really doing, absolutely, it's punishing spouses just like express entry punishes, punishes spouses. So if you want to take it up with someone and remember, and I always say this, if you want to take it up with someone, you don't like what's happening. Minister Miller is the guy, right? His party, the liberal party is the one that is making all of these decisions. And before him, I think you guys remember if we pop this down, Minister Fraser was attesting to the virtues of international students and he really opened up the coffers. So the, the numbers of individuals that have come in have just, skyrocketed um, under the, you know, under the, the liberal program. And, um, and so we'll see how it plays out. But remember, that is those, that's where the decisions are being made. Um, okay, so let's keep going through here. Um, okay, Akash says, hey, Mark, did you say this will affect postgrad work permits for students graduating from public colleges as well? I thought it was only spousal open work permit and private institutions that are affected. Postgrad work permits are going to be limited to, and if we go right to this, right to the actual instructions, let's see if we can pull this up right now, and then we'll look at it together so I can show you. I always like to show the source. Starting September the 1st, okay, 2024, international students who begin a study program that is part of a curriculum licensing arrangement will no longer be eligible for postgrad work permits upon graduation under curriculum license agreements, then they talk about these and they talk about these programs ha having seen significant growth, blah, 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 blah. And you can see here, then they talk about graduates of masters and other short graduate level programs will soon be eligible for potential three years, which is really, really good. And, uh, and then you can see this is the uncertainty in the weeks ahead. What does this mean? 
open work permits will only be available to spouses of international students in master's and doctoral programs. So just to clarify here, and I, and I don't mean to, to create confusion. If you're coming to study in, uh, like, and it's the provinces that are going to have to sort this out. If you're coming to study in a public institution, yes, postgrad work permits um, uh, may very well be available. And this is a great opportunity for me to shift here. We don't know exactly how this is going to shake down because provinces are going to have to decide who are they granting the ability to, to you know, uh, to to even um, have international students come and study. Which ones are going to be DLIs? And IRCC and, and the minister, he was visibly frustrated. He said, with the provinces for not taking action sooner. Well, this is really complicated. And when they announced it last fall and expect provinces to already make changes, nah, they already had in mind what they were going to do. So if you look here, this is really the place that you have to go to the list of designated learning institutions. And ultimately what shakes down, we have to assume, yes, that, that public schools are still going to have the ability to get um, postgrad work permits. But if you scroll down here, this is the source, okay? And don't trust anything other than this. So if I go to Alberta here, you can see all of these. So offers postgrad eligible programs right now. It's already broken down here. So you can see some of these ones are DLIs and I don't even know why they grant them DLI status. I'll be honest, I don't. Why grant a school a DLI status if they also don't have the ability to um, offer a postgrad work permit. But anyway, so you can see through here, all these no's till we get to adventure aviation. So this is in Grand Prairie and yes, it does offer postgrad work permits. So will adventure aviation make the cut, right? That's the question. And, and we're just looking at Alberta here, right? So you can see Alberta Bible College also has a DLI and some limited postgrad. What will, how will it impact Alberta Bible College? And you can see we have, um, and then the University of, Alberta University of Arts is yes. Well, is that going to be, is that going to make the cut? But this is where you go, guys. You absolutely have to go to the designated learning institutions list. And then from there, going forward, you can figure it out. But those of you who've jumped in late, I want to reiterate something I said before. As of January 22nd, you need an attestation letter from a province or territory where you plan to study. Quebec is the only province I know that actually has this in place. So, until the provinces have an attestation letter process in place, which the minister has given them until really March 31st, you cannot submit a study permit application because it will be returned. It absolutely will. And there's even, I think, further explanation down here. You can see most students need to provide an attestation letter from the province or territory where they plan to study. So if you're in the process of submitting your study permit application and you have not yet submitted it, stop. Stop, stop, because you are not, your application is going to get returned. So it says how to get a letter. Each province is developing a process to get it. Okay, that's not terribly helpful. These processes are expected to be in place by March 31st. We'll update this page for more information. So bookmark this page, all right? So study permits and then get the right uh, documents. It's, it's uh, studying in Canada as an international student and then study permit. This here, the process, as you scroll down, this is the page that's going to be updated. And as we go down here and just continue down reading this, you'll see here that they will return any application received on, which is today or after, without an attestation letter, unless you're exempt. Who's exempt? Well, you don't need one if you are a minor child accompanying your parents, grade 12 or under. A student applying for a master's PhD, we know that, that's pretty clear. But what the heck is a postgraduate program? What do you mean by that? It's obviously not a master's. So what is the other postgraduate program? Okay. And then also you can see here a student applying to extend their study permit. So if you're here, you're okay. And, uh, you know, it says learn about these changes, which basically takes you right back to this page here. All right. So thank you for pointing that out. And I didn't mean to confuse things, Akash. The reality is we don't know exactly what this is going to look like, we don't. And so all of you who are midstream with your overseas education agents who have paid money to go to one of these private schools that, that are on the naughty list, at least in terms of immigration, you guys need to very quickly start requesting your money back. Do not proceed. Because some of these may not even have a DLI designation after this. I don't know. And you know as much as I do that 
if you come into school, you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever crazy amounts that they charge. Well, you, you, if you don't, if you don't have a pathway, some pathway to get an open work permit after to work and gain Canadian work experience, do you really want to do that? Public schools are completely different and they recognize that, you know, there are some real bad actors at play here and it's just been fed money, greed, right? That's the problem. It's always been money and greed. Okay, let's jump back here. And I shouldn't say that, not money and greed. Well, money, yes, because, you know, many of the problems have cut back funding to the, to the educational institutions. And so how do you make money? You charge your international students three times what you charge your, your locals. And then that can make up the funds. So, and that's what's happened. All right. Um, okay, so Jay, we're not going to answer your question. We're focusing just on this. Um, okay, Ross says, I'll be on a post-grad after graduating two-year program on June 2024. Am I eligible to study uh, PSW in a private college while working on my field of study? Or is it studying French more recommended? Yeah, Ross, this is also kind of outside of the realm of this. Join us on Wednesday and we're going to have our, our live Q&A. Um, okay, Bardu says, I'm waiting clarification from Canada on whether post-grad certificates or post-grad diplomas will be eligible for post-grad. I'm still not clear on this. That's exactly what I identified, right? We just don't know exactly what they mean by that. And hopefully they will be able to explain it to us. Because what does other postgraduate programs mean? We just don't know for sure. So, but remember, even aside from that, the attestations as of today are a mandatory requirement, requirement, which effectively suspends the study permit program. What happens, right? So a couple other questions I have is, well, what happens to any institutions or otherwise that have already accepted and issued admissions for September? What happens to them, right? If they are schools that do not fit into the approved list. So there's just a ton of uncertainty We'll just have to watch it. Okay. Uh, Arvind says, whether post-grad duration increased to three years for even short master's program, it's possible, Arvind. That is something that they identified in the um, news release. That's what the minister had indicated, right? And if we jump back here, you'll see here, he specifically says that, right? That master's and, and other short graduate level programs will soon be eligible to apply for a three-year, which suggests that individuals who are studying in some of these approved programs could see themselves getting a three-year work permit, even if it's maybe a one-year program. It just depends on how they ultimately interpret these things. Um, okay, uh, Verinder says, do you think they would go back to issuing a spousal open work permit to postgrad work permit holders in tier zero, one, two, three only? Right now, all tiers can apply. Remember, the all tiers are as much an impact on... Um, uh, the, the, the actual work permit, skilled workers in Canada. And so the, there's both of those equations, those who are working on a skilled work permit and international students. I don't think, I think what they're going to do is they're going to tie it closer to individual schools. Um, if ultimately they decide to do it, like we said, for master's and PhD, if they choose to do it for in-demand occupations, right? And we know that what they've identified, maybe healthcare, uh, maybe trades, construction, Right. And those postgrad work permits for trades and construction, you know, right now they're saying, well, you know, maybe some of these schools may not have the ability to secure, um, you know, those work permits. But there's a negotiation that Minister Miller said that they're going to have with the provinces. And so we'll see how things flush out. I can't wait till the program delivery instructions are released. I'll be right on here uh, breaking it down for all of you guys. Okay. Uh, is this will be applied retroactively for postgrad work permit holders? Graduates of master's and other short graduate level programs will soon be eligible. Yeah, I can't see it being, um, Chico, I can't see it going back retroactively. Nope. Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay. Um, okay, Amir says, are public and community colleges the same things? Um, public colleges, community colleges, yes. Generally speaking, they are. Public is public. Like like Lethbridge College, for instance, I'll use my hometown here. It used to be called Lethbridge Community College, but it's quite interchangeable. The key is public. Public versus private. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Argentech says someone just offered me six schools here in BC for purchase 1 million each. Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's uh, not the best investment, that's for sure. Um, and I have to assume that uh, anyone offering that many schools that they own, they're part of the problem and they're the bad actors. So happy to see them get shut down. Okay, um, all right, so now let's get to your comments. And, and like I said, I welcome your thoughts on this. So now I'm out, uh, Roshash says, so now I'm out of the equation, out of the equation now. We have a plan with my wife to apply for open work permit this month. She's currently studying in SAIT. It's entirely possible. Like you said, in the instructions, it says in the coming weeks. So if I flip back here, we don't know when they're going to kickstart this, right? So it says here in the coming weeks ahead, open work permits will only be available to spouses of international students in master's and doctoral programs. So it's so weird that they would say in the coming weeks, like what the heck does that mean? And that's why I get so frustrated sometime with Mr. Miller and their rollouts. Like figure this stuff out before you're going to announce it, like figure it out. So I hear you. It's entirely possible that that, you know, may be um, a problem for you. You know, we'll just have to see. Okay. <laughs> so too, too much here said, I knew this is coming. Well, that's great. Uh, Miller mentioned um, regularizing study permits and postgrad several times since the past year. We're not talking about Miller. Miller's just, he's just following through that with all of the things that were said years ago. And so this is where I'll jump back as I shared it with my, in a blog post um, that I, that I did. Let's see if I can find here. Uh, I'm going to go here and I'll show you this. I'm going to share it. Okay. So we can go back a long ways, right? So this was September the 21st, 2022. So over, let's see, what is it? A year or so? Yeah. Over a year in here. This was from the minister's report on his strategies to tr expand transitions to permanent residence. Who was the minister? The minister wasn't Miller. Uh, the minister was, let's actually, it wasn't Miller. We'll pull up. It was Minister Fraser. So he's the one who, who brought this forward. And my six takeaways, and I, I, I'd indicated that it's not fluff, that this wasn't just some regurgitation because Minister Fraser not only did he highlight, once again, the targeted draws for, for category-based draws, um, and I pulled out of there as well, the rise of rural Canada, right? Outside of Ontario, BC, going to other locations. And then French, of course, as we've seen, has is, is come to fruition. And then the last one, international students must be strategic about where they're studying in Canada. So this is stuff that I talked about, you know, and you can go back and read the blog post, but basically you can see here, they say, tucked away quietly within the report was an acknowledgement. I shouldn't say they say I wrote this, um, was an acknowledgement of a lack of diversity within the ranks of our international students. So, and I warned, you know, countries like India and China, like be ready because when it comes to this diversification, well, what are they going to do? They, they can cap just about anything they want to do. So we'll see there's so much more that's going to be um, rolled out. And then I said here, finally pay attention to where your school is located and what you're choosing to study. Because we could see changes that the provinces could make, um, could, could focus on, um, you know, granting the, the sacred spots to schools that have programs that are addressing immediate labor shortages in those provinces. So IRCC has made it clear that they want students to choose programs of study outside the major urban centers. And then I said, I can't help but think that IRCC will bake this ingredient into their advanced analytics when assessing study permit applications. And um, yeah, they've said, the minister, Minister Fraser said they're going to incentivize students to look beyond major urban centers when choosing a program of study. I listen, you should listen too. So those are just some of the factors that I wanted to point out, um, in addition to too much kimchi here, that this has been a long time coming. I'm actually surprised that it has taken this long for them to come up with this. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, okay. We've got a super chat here from Jay. Jay says, okay, I'll try to answer this, but guys, we're focusing on the specific topic. Work permit expires 16th of February, two year experience in BMO in Ontario. If that's bank, man, don't, don't, you guys don't go and work in banks. They're not going to help you. Have job offer Nova Scotia is AIP listed. Job starts February the 5th. Okay. And your work permit expires February 24th. Can I apply in the Nova Scotia INP uh, immigrant nominee program or the uh, Atlantic immigration program? Jay, you need to book a consult. 
And with that timing, it's going to be really hard for you to meet anything because remember the AIP is, it takes time to issue an open work permit under that program. And it takes time for the employer to go through that process. So um, whether the employer is on the list or not, the, the key is that it takes time for those applications to go forward. And you're going to be really hard pressed with timing because from February, the, what you've got here, the 5th to the 24th, that's not a lot of time to sort it out. So I recommend you book a consult. And anyone that has, um, has gone to our website, you know, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is just go to the site and then we have um, links all over the place for booking a, a consultation. Why? Because we do a ton of them, a ton. Okay, so you can go to our site and check it out. All right, jumping back. Let's get to some more questions here. Um, and we've got a ton of questions that are piling up and I'm really going to try to get through as many as I can. Um, okay, all about IELTS says, are students currently studying in a public private college eligible to obtain a postgrad a graduation diploma work permit after finishing their studies in December 2024? This we will have to see. We'll just have to see. Um, we know that they're on the list. Like they are in a position, a vulnerable position, because the province is the one that will divvy out uh, for new people. But the ones that are already studying, um, it appears like they can obtain, continue to extend their study permit if they need to. But for the issuance of post, uh, you know, for the issuance of a, of a post, uh, you, you call it post-graduation diploma work permit, a post-grad work permit, um, we'll just have to see how it plays out. Once, like I said, once the PDIs are released, I'll have more information for sure. Um, yeah. And someone else asked, will postgrad work permits be granted to colleges who are public? Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, I think the answer is yes, but it'll depend on the province. The province makes that call. And like we've indicated, yes, I bet province is underfunded, uh, post-secondary education. You could also, you have to understand though, too, a bit. Okay. I'm going to point this out because I have no affiliations with any universities, no colleges or otherwise. And the reality is colleges for all intents and purposes and, and, and public education institutions also have to run their programs with fiscal responsibility. And so I know, take, a, take any company, right? The costs, you have to balance those. And if the costs are, are skyrocketing, whether that's the, you know, whether that's the university or, or college um, instructors or professors, whether, whether or not it's their, that's their salaries, whether or not it's the, the actual tuition that students pay, there has to be a balance between those two. And you can't always look to the provinces to, to save you. You can't always look to the provinces for funding to make things up. And some of the, you know, some educational institutions could probably run a little bit leaner. I know that many of them do a very, very good job at trying to navigate their way through when the costs of running programs are so astronomically high. Um, but there's a, there's a cost analysis, you know, it's, it's economics and um, yes, we as taxpayers in Canada um, are, are happy to pay funds to subsidize um, educational programs that are really um, creating the next generation of, of leaders in our country, the le next generation of, of individuals that are going to fill essential roles and, and to work. Um, but ultimately, you know, our, our universities offering programs that don't really translate well to jobs, you know, do they have programs that, um, yeah, are just not really, uh, you know, giving the, the student graduates from them a, a fair shot at, at, at good uh, employment opportunities. And uh, it's not all about employment for sure when you go to study in universities, in particular universities. The colleges tend to be a little bit more, more focused. But understand, there are programs at universities that are not going to lead to good employment opportunities. And so do, do universities need to reconsider whether or not they're offering those programs. Right. And so that's all of the, you know, those are all difficult decisions and difficult questions that have to be answered. Um, I don't have the answers to them. Um, should the provinces be providing more funding to the schools? Well, they may very well need to be. And that's what's created this. I get it. But it's a multifaceted problem. And, and it's not just the, pro the, the, the fault of the provinces for underfunding. Right. That's saying, well, we're going to we're going to, you know, astronomically increase our costs to to whatever level we want. And it's up to you, taxpayer, to pay me as a university to keep our programs running, even though we're, we're our costs are just out, outrageous and, you know, um, un, un, out of control. Um, I'm not saying that's the case at all, but that's just an example. 
Okay, let's see here. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Writer K says, I hope your car maintenance that you mentioned in your afternoon live went well. Well, let's just say I got the vehicle back. They said there was no issues with it. Um, needless to say, I'm not too happy right now. I'm not going to publicly shame the uh, manufacturer of my vehicle, but I'm a little bit frustrated because um, they said, oh, there was nothing we could see, even though it went into limp mode and the vehicle uh, had trouble starting. And I got a, a warning from the manufacturer themselves that there were problems with the vehicle. So how is that possible and not find anything? But yes, it's hard for students from war-torn countries to apply for study permits and get a visa. Exactly. So what did these changes result in? Like if we go back here and look at the at the study permit process, right? One of the things that they increased was, and you can see right at the beginning, is the, um, the, the financial requirements. So if we open up these financial requirements for international students, before January the 1st, 10. After January the 1st, 20,635 is a single. And so what does that mean? Well, it pretty much becomes a program of the elite. Now, Minister Fraser in his discussion today, his, his news release, um, uh, or press release, whatever you want to call it, he did identify that they're looking at ways to try to make pathways open for individuals from other countries. Because obviously tuition is, is just off the charts and it's not easy to, to be able to afford it when it's like three times your annual salary uh, to have the minimum funds. And so only the rich can afford to send their students to study internationally. So I hear you. I really do. Okay, let's see what Joe has to say here. He says, my take on this is that although this is one way to put a halt or slow down student exploit in sham schools, they should have created more pathways to pair with this to balance it out. We'll see. I agree. And interestingly enough, the minister did say, and I think it was in the news uh, circular, that they did talk about the fact that they're looking at other ways to, to try to stabilize things. And um, I can't find the exact quote, but, uh, but yeah, they haven't ruled out maybe some other form of pathway. But I'll be honest, you guys, when I, everything that I've heard, uh, I've heard Minister Miller here say is, is that, hey, not all students are going to have pathways to permanent residence. And many, many of you will simply need to go home when your when you're post-grad work permits expire. And I think that's fully what they're expecting is for people to, to just go home. All right, let's keep going here. Um, Okay, Shiko asks a really good question again. Do you think that they gave life for those who was waiting for the extension of the postgrad after this new three-year postgrad work permit? Um, did, oh, did they give a life for those who, you know, probably give a <laughs> give a darn, right? Uh, for those who was waiting for the extension of the postgrad after this new three-year postgrad work permit? Um, no, I don't think so. Like Minister Miller is very clearly indicated, um, and they revised. Uh, there was kind of a, uh, another news release. Um, and they specifically identified the fact that they are not going to be, let's see if I can find it here. Um, maybe it was in the backgrounder. They specifically identified that the 18 month would not be continuing. Um, let's see here. Oh, yes. So you can see here, I'll, I'll share this with you. And this is just in the Making Canada's International Student Program Sustainable. It's the backgrounder associated with this report. It was also, um, it was released January 22nd today. And if you go down here and you look, they talk about um, some of the temporary policies affecting students. So the waiver on the 20 hour, it's kind of strange. You know, they talk about, okay, well, maybe for some students that do have, um, you know, are eligible to get a postgrad, that they might increase it 30 hours per week while class is in session. I don't know. I don't agree with that. I really don't. If you're here to study, you really want to do as good as you can. They talk about the facilitative measures here. Um, and then you talk about here as well, the additional 18 month postgrad. Well, the reality is um, that the, they, let's just see here. Okay. However, this temporary, you can see, however, this temporary public policy has not been extended. Um, returning to the longstanding policy that an international graduate is eligible for only one postgrad work permit in their lifetime. And those with post-grad work permits expiring in 2024 who haven't transitioned to permanent residence will need to determine if they're eligible to apply for an, another type of work permit or if they will, right here, need to leave Canada when their status expires. And that is consistently the messaging 
that this minister, not this minister, but this minister has said. All right, and that's what he's he's held out. Okay, let's jump to a few more here as we're closing in on our time. I don't think we have any more supers. I think they're just one that one super chat. Okay. Um, okay, this is tricky. Okay, so Nadi, this is a great question. My intake is in May 2024. I was planning to apply for the visa on the 25th of January. Please, can I go ahead and apply or I have to wait for the provincial attestation letter? It's clear, Nadi. You can't apply. You can't. Not until you get that attestation letter. So it's a, it's a hard no. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, Abed says, so fewer jobs created, not enough houses, strain on healthcare, rising grocery prices. Overall, this is a debacle at multiple levels. Yes, I agree. I agree. All right. Um, Harpreet says, I'm studying in Canada and my, stu- my study will complete on the 6th of September, 2024. Will I get a post-grad work permit? I have to assume, Harpreet, that individuals that are currently in, there will be some grandfathering. I have to assume, but we'll have to, pl- we'll have to see how it plays out. Okay. Um, that's true, Joe. Joe says, lower temporary residence means 500 plus people on the pool will be flushed out and more chances for people who have lower CRS. Yes, that is that is the case. Now, how long it takes to get there, we'll just have to see. Um, Hans says, do you need an attestation letter for study uh, student permit extensions? No, you do not. And as always, guys, I jump back here and show you. Oh, I've got a bunch of things going on here. Um, when you go through here, and if we go to the attestation section here, you'll see uh there a student applying to extend their study permit doesn't need an attestation letter so at least that's a positive right that's a positive okay um yes and akash there's no clarification i can provide to you the other postgraduate programs we don't know exactly what they mean by that all right um Zip through a few more. Um, and I think Grims, Gimson, we talked about this. Students and their spouses are already in Canada. I have to assume will be grandfathered in and that you will have the ability to uh, to extend those spousal open work permits. But we'll have to see. All right, Abdel, let's see what you got here. He says, IRCC talk about corruption on those bad actor greedy schools, but IRCC itself is corrupted. We have no transparency toward the processing of applications with their secret tools. Well. That's a take. That's a take. Um, McNee, I know you've got a bunch of posts here. I'll pull this one up. You're right. They want to concentrate international to university, not college. That is correct. At least so far, insofar as just the the undergraduate uh, type programs, right? Masters, PhD, and some postgraduate, whatever that means, um, are a priority. Um, I don't think, like as far as this comment, they want to make university profit. I don't think that's the case. They just want to maintain the integrity of the institutions and the, the private colleges, you know, have demonstrated at least otherwise the minister wouldn't have said this, that they're just not keeping up with um, the standard of education that Canada has been known for. So, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see what we have next here. Okay. So Louv says, so I'm pursuing a postgrad certificate in technology management from Saskatchewan Polytechnic. Will I be eligible for a three-year work permit? I will graduate in April, 2024. Well, you'll just have to see. That's something I can't answer. Uh, Franklin, you're very welcome. Okay. Okay, so uh, Sambav says, I've completed one year program and applied for another one year program, 1st of May, 2024, thinking to get through your post-grad. Do you think now I'll be eligible for post-grad if not doing post-grad program? Uh, I don't know. And there's a lot of, uh, like, I'm not going to pretend like I know. Um, and I think anyone who does is, is, is just doing a disservice to people. But I can tell you, the moment those program delivery instructions are announced, I will be out here going through them, dissecting them, and breaking down all of these uncertainties that we're experiencing right now. Um, and especially people that are asking about specific colleges. 
Like for example, um, KV here says, Hey sir, my college is a Cinnaboyne community college at Robertson Col uh, at Robertson college. My intake, I got my visa. Will I get post-grad in the future that I cannot tell you. Um, you know, the, the question becomes, so a Cinnaboyne community college is probably public and I, I'm just guessing here. So please don't assume it. One of the, the things, and I want to, I want to go back and explain this to you guys. Um, really what they're, the, the evil, I guess, that they're trying to combat. And let's see if I can pull this up here. Give me a second. Okay, so I want to read this. And then you tell me, KV, if, if you see, if this seems like your situation. So starting September the 1st, international students who begin a study program that is part of a curriculum licensing arrangement um, will no longer be eligible for a postgrad work permit. And what is that? So under a curriculum licensing agreement, now listen to this and see if it applies to you. Students physically attending a private college that has been licensed to deliver the curriculum of an associated public college. That's what they mean by that. And you can see this is IRCC's comments, not me about the quality of that education. These programs have seen significant growth in attracting international students in recent years, though they have less oversight than public colleges, and they act as a loophole with regards to post-grad work permit eligibility. So you can see they're specifically identifying this as being a challenge and something they're trying to combat. So I don't know if that's your situation, Cavi, with your schools. I don't know every school. In fact, I don't do a lot of uh, study permit applications. Um, uh, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not not in that market. No, the, uh, the overseas educational agents, man, they must be freaking out some of them who have just made boatloads of money off of you guys. And the owners of these private schools are, are really going to be stinging. Uh, hopefully they've got their houses all paid off now before this all gets shut down. Um, okay, so Hannah says, so it's not possible at all to bring my spouse, even if I get a study permit for a post-grad work permit program. Hannah, we will have to see how it plays out. But right now, and I know the, the minister is will be in discussions with provinces, right now spousal open work permits are limited to those three categories, right? The master's, PhD, and some postgraduate programs. So we'll have to see how it plays out, Hannah. In the coming days, usually it takes a day or two for the program delivery instructions to be released. If it's released tomorrow, I will go live tomorrow and make sure you join me. And that's a reminder for all of you, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, wherever you're watching this, whether it's on X, whether it's on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn, we try to broadcast out to all of these as well as YouTube. But YouTube's a pretty easy way to subscribe to the channel and then pay attention because I'll be out there the moment I hear uh, with any breaking news. New Media says, hey, Mark, I'm currently an international student. Should I be worried about my pathway to immigration looking forward? New Media, you should have been worried before. Long before this, you should have been worried. Just as you see, no CEC draws. The CRS scores continuing to top up. And I'm assuming New Media, maybe I'll guess, are you in Ontario? If you're in Ontario, yes, you should be concerned um, because the pathways are just going to be limited. They just are. Uh, there's way too many people. 51% of all international students as of 2022 were destined to Ontario. So when people book consults with me, and there's links to all this stuff below in the description, you guys. Um, if you want to connect with me after, book a consult or, or retain our firm or whatever it might be, um, there's links in the description. But for you, Namidia, yeah, I would. Like all international students need to be worried about pathways to permanent residence. Um, our minister has been very, very clear right here that there will not be a pathway for everyone. All right, we've got a super here. Let's hit another super. This one is from uh, Dhruv. He says, private colleges that are now, uh, that are post-grad work permit eligible right now, will those colleges won't provide post-grads from September onwards? Absolutely, that could be the case. So private colleges are the ones that they are targeting. Now, maybe not all private colleges are going to be caught by this, but you have to be aware, yes, September onwards, that is exactly the case. Exactly the case. Um, all right, thanks. That's a great question. Okay, now I got to scroll down here and see if I can get back to my spot. Um, I get it. I get it, Roshash. It is, it is heartbreaking. Um, Gimson says, what about international students who are studying in college and their spouses? Like I said before, I have to assume IRCC is going to grandfather you guys in. Um, that's right. It is distressing, but it is what it is. And, you know, many people, like I talked about before, 
many people who are outside of Canada have looked at, and let's look at these rounds of invitations for a second. I just want to touch on this very quick. I know those of you who are watching here are probably wondering, where's Mark going with this? It's a Q&A. At the beginning, we had a little bit more discussions about, you know, um, the, the impact of this. We talked about express entry. Uh, we talked about a bunch of different things. I'm just trying to get the uh, invitations, the rounds of invitations to show up here on my screen, and it's, it's resisting me. What is going on? Okay, here we go. Now it's popped up. So if you look, and we looked at this historically, and I want to point this out uh, just one more time because it'll be really good to help you guys understand. If you look, okay, we don't care about the last one, but if we look at the previous rounds of invitations, and you can see the general draws are super high, okay? Let's take this and let's look at the CRS criteria quickly. All I do is rely on the source documents, right, guys? So if we go down here and we look at what I want to focus in on is Canadian education. Because with the reduction in the number of postgrad work permits issued, I want to show you this here. Okay, so if individuals are not going to have as many opportunities for postgrad work permits, one year, that's 35 points if you've got a spouse here, 40 points if you're single. If these scores, if there's fewer people that have this one year, what is the impact? Well, if you take this and reduce 40 points, well, you know, it'll take it down to 506. If you go down here and we're going to go all the way back to the last no program specified before they change it to the general draws back in October, the CRS score is 500. So you take 35 off of 500, which puts you down to what? 565. So is that, is that possible? Will the scores go down that far? I think it's distinctively possible if, if immigration continues down the path they're going. And so what will the scores look like? Well, I think they could very well look like, I don't know how far we can go back here, the pre-pandemic levels. Let's just keep going down to the pre-pandemic, which was 2019. And you look at the, um, the no program specified draw, March the 4th, it was the last one before the border shut down, 471, 470, 472, 471. And back December, December 19th, it was 469. And what is 469? If you go to, let me just, I'll just pull this up so you guys can see this. Um, this is my express entry accelerator. This is actually the course. So in CRS case scenario, I've got lesson four here. I think I can do this. Let's see. Johnny, no chance. Okay. So I've kind of jumped the gun a bit. So this is a typical candidate that used to be a rock star, you guys. So Johnny No Chance here, 29 years old, single master's in programming, IELTS at a CLB9, that's the 8777, three years foreign work experience, no work in experience in Canada, no LMIA, no PNP, no relatives in Canada. Johnny No Chance, and the current world, is Johnny No Chance. But when you look, and I'll just advance it here a little bit, you can see his score is 469. And so will, is it possible that we could return back to the era, the pre-pandemic era of, of rounds of invitations where people with a score of 469 qualify? I think it's distinctly possible. 471, 472, these scores mean that your language scores are just a little bit higher. And so is it possible to hit this level? I think it is. I think that people outside of Canada who are looking, is Canada, you know, will there be options for me through express entry? Um, if I don't have some connection to Canada, I think the answer is yes. Eventually, we are going to get back to that, especially if the minister continues to, you know, to, to follow through with whatever restrictions they're putting in place on the numbers of international students that are coming. But look, 360,000 for 2024, which is effectively, the minister said, it's a 30, I think about a 35% reduction. Yeah, decrease from last year, 35%. Um, and we don't know what will happen for 2025. I don't think, I can't remember exactly where it says it, but um, uh, yeah, the temporary measures will be in place for two years and the number of new study permit applications that will be accepted in 2025 will be reassessed at the end of this year. So we don't even know. Maybe they'll drop it even further. We just don't know. So all, all we do know is that the cards are all in Minister Miller's hands and what he does with them, we'll have to see. All right, we're kind of, we hit the hour here. I'm going to answer a few more questions and then we're going to 
we're going to wrap it up for now. I appreciate everybody for being here. All right, let's see. Um, uh, okay, and just to reiterate, Trista Lee says, I'm currently studying postgrad certificate. Do I receive a three-year postgrad after I graduate? We will see, right? I think individuals that are currently in these schools studying, um, I have to assume that there's going to be some form of, uh, you know, some form of, of um, grandfathering of postgrad work permits, but there's just no guarantee. We just don't know. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay, Arvin says, hey, any chance of an existing postgrad work permit of one year already issued for one year masters will be increased to three years? I don't think so, Arvind. Um, I think the I think usually when immigration institutes these policies, they set um, they set a start date, and they will at times at times they can grandfather, but I don't think in this situation they will. I don't believe so. Once again, we're speculating, right? Um, Gim says, "What about international students who are studying currently in college and their spouses?" We talked about that. I think there's a chance. Um, I think there's a chance that that immigration, because it would be cruel to say, okay, now all spouses that are here, you just have to go home, right? We're not going to allow you to renew your post-grad work permit, the, the spousal open work permit. Okay, let's see what else we have here. We've got a couple of duplications of comments that I'm sifting through, so I apologize for that. Let's see. Um, Okay, Anoush asks, this is a question many people are asking. I already got a postgrad certificate, uh, postgraduate certificate admission in York University. Can I apply for a study permit with a, a spousal open work permit with kids in coming days? Will I, my spouse will get spousal open work permit? This is something that we don't know. Right now, we know that the minister has said that in the coming weeks, they are going to institute this. So, you know, ultimately, if that's the decision, I recommend that you go ahead as fast as you can and submit the application before they block it and before they lock it out. So in the coming weeks ahead, open work permits will only be available. What that means is right now, you can submit that application. And I strongly encourage you to do that. Submit it as quickly as possible um, because, you know, when usually when they make the decision that they're no longer going to do it, and what are weeks? Like weeks could be one month. It could be two months, you know? You should say coming months, but we've seen immigration prolong this over and over, right guys? Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. Okay. We're just, we've got lots of comments from lots of people. I get it. Uh, I'm skipping some of them. All right. Um, Okay, let's let's hit it, Nadi. So Nadi says, so Canada accepted 900,000 refugees from Ukraine. Okay, they're not refugees. So let's start that. Um, and then blame international students for housing crisis. This is totally unfair. Just stop giving student visas. Okay, Nadi, this isn't accurate. So you need to be careful when you're posting comments. So so the they they issued 900,000 work permits um, uh, to uh, to to well, I think they. They had 1 million applications, right? How many actually came to Canada? I think we're in the 250 to 300,000 range, but absolutely international students are not, are not the, the sole blame for what's happened. They're not. Did they play a part? Absolutely the numbers, but it's not even the student's fault. It's the, it's the government for agreeing to allow so many to come in, which put a strain on our housing and otherwise. But even then, they were not the sole responsible entity. They play a role, and anyone who says they don't is disingenuous because the large numbers of international international students has absolutely affected um, housing and access to healthcare and things like that. But no more, no less than the other hundreds of thousands they brought in through other streams. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. Um, okay, Abrar says I'm in Canada. Applying for a second new study permit from inside Canada. Will I need an attestation letter? Nope. We talked about that one. You won't need a new attestation letter. That comes straight from the uh, from government's instructions there. Okay, we've got another super chat. This is from Diljot. Diljot says, currently I'm studying in public college and it's my last semester. Do I receive my three-year postgrad? You should. There shouldn't be any restrictions to that um, at this stage, Diljot. You should be fine. 
Okay, now we'll jump back down here to kind of where I left off. Um, let's see here. Okay, Gada is speculating here. He says, I think they mean with postgraduate program is postgraduate certificate. I wouldn't take that. Uh, I, I wouldn't take that one to the bank. I think we'll have to see because ultimately I think the provinces will have a say in this. Okay. Um, it's a long comment here. Okay, I'm going to pull this one up. and This is big. It's a big comment from Kabir, and I've got no problems addressing it. So let's just take a look at this. And now, these some of these things are just not true, Kabir, okay? But I recognize that a lot of them are realities when you're coming to study in Canada. So he says, why immigrants are exploited from the first day? From higher tuition fees? Well, they pay a higher tuition fee because Canadian and permanent resident students um, they themselves or their parents have already worked, paid taxes, and a part of the tuition um, that is subsidized for Canadians and permanent residents is because of Canadian taxpayers, okay? So the institutions are partially funded, the public institutions. Um, private institutions are all in the backs of the tuition fee holders. So uh, of, of those who are applying, the tuition fees are all a part of uh, the sustainability of those schools or the greed, I guess, of some of them. But, um, okay, so we touch on that one. Um, for same education, to high rents, okay, everybody pays the same high rents. High taxes, everybody pays the same high taxes, whether you're an international student or whether you're a Canadian or permanent resident. Less number of working hours, well, once again, if you're on an open work permit and you've got a crappy employer, well, they're crappy to their Canadian and, and permanent resident employees as much as their foreign workers. However, what happens is the Canadians and permanent residents typically hit the road and say, get lost, you're a terrible employer. And that's a good point because I want to point something out to you guys. As long as you're willing to take that crap from crappy employers, they will continue to abuse you and take advantage of you. Unless you're, un you're willing to come forward and complain about um, unfair working conditions, um, illegal labor practices, all of those things, then you will continue to reward those crappy employers. And guess what the crappy employers do? The crappy franchise that's exploiting you is putting out of business the other good businesses that are you know, paying their employees overtime, that are paying them fair wages. So you are contributing to the problem when you don't come forward and, and, and complain about it. So I'll just put that one out there. But I understand the situation you're in. It's situations of desperation. And ironically, this is one of the things that Minister Miller talked about. He said, look, if you coming to Canada is going to put you in a financial position where you are vulnerable for exploitation and you're desperate, then maybe you should not have come in the beginning. Maybe you should not have come to study um, uh, knowing that you didn't have enough funds to support yourself. And this is what Minister Miller, this is the message that he was trying to get across. Do I agree with that? Well, I think there's some truth to it. But there's also truth to the fact that people, just the very nature of how the, the system is set up, are, are ripe for exploitation. I wish the punishments were severe for employers who exploited workers. I wish that anyone who became a permanent resident and they themselves set up a business and was found to have bad labor practices, exploiting workers, that they would be have their permanent residence revoked and sent back to their country. That's how I feel. Canadians, natural-born Canadians, or other citizens that are naturalized citizens, they should go to jail. Simple as that. That's how I feel about this. And it's not the first time I've said it. Um, okay, he says uh, high interest rates. Okay, high insurances. Those are all the same thing Canadians pay. High chances of getting convicted of a crime if you're an immigrant. That is false. That is false. Okay, I'll call you out on that. That's BS. Um, who just gets a warning for the same crime. That's BS. Not true. Not true at all. Why is that happening? They are contributing the same to your, your, to your economy. Okay, the, the reality is, like, I hear where you're coming from. I hear Kabir, I really do. And there's truth to a lot of this. But understand, when you come to a country and you're not a Canadian citizen or permanent resident, I look at what Canada offers. Let's compare it to, say, Saudi Arabia. How many rights and privileges do you have in Saudi Arabia? I don't know. As long as you're working and accepting the wage, you can stay. You know, um, I look at other countries in the world. 
And it would be really wise to compare, you know, the, the, the similarities and, and challenges. The problem that we face, right, and I'm going to take this one off so I can talk very candidly with you guys, is that there are some wonderful things about Canada. Wonderful. I love my country. I hate what the immigration, although I'm in the immigration industry, I hate what immigration representatives, crooked actors, crooked consultants, you know, exploitive lawyers, I hate what they've done to my country. I hate what they've done to my programs, my immigration programs. I love Canada. I love what it has to offer. But it's always the bad actors who screw things up for everyone else. And yeah, you guys who are here as international students who were sold a bill, a bill of goods, who were told you had pathways to permanent residence and just fork over the cash, come to my stupid private little school. I'll give you a meaningless degree and then you can get a postgrad work permit work wherever you want, right? And get permanent residence. That's what you guys were told. And that's what angers me because now you're basically being said, well, too bad. We don't need you anymore, right? That's the messaging. And that makes me angry. And it's not your fault. It's the people who tricked and exploited you. But please, please understand that underneath all of this scuzzy corruption, um, you know, and I put, I put a lot of the blame on our government as well. Um, and I don't make any, I don't hold back any bones about it. Some of the decisions that they've made have put us specifically in this situation. A lot of the decisions the liberal government did. So those of you who think that, you know, the, the liberal government is the party of the immigrant, well, take a look now. They're a party of getting elected, just like every other, every other party, right? They will, they will do what they think are gonna, is going to allow them to get more votes. And, and the conservatives would do the same thing. The liberals would do the same thing, the NDP. And, and so we're a product of the government as well, what has happened here. Um, and I feel for you guys. But please understand, compare Canada to other countries and look at what's happening. We are not perfect and we've got issues and we've got problems, absolutely, that were created. Um, but there is so much good here. And would I want to live anywhere else in the world? No, I would not. Um, and I guess that's it. I'll leave it at that. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, let's see. And I'll try to get to some new people here. Um, and those of you who are asking specific questions about schools, we'll just have to see. So currently studying a post-grad program in Humber. Will I be eligible for a post-grad after completion in August 2024? Like I said, I think most people that are currently studying and had post-grad post work permit eligibility um, will probably have that at the end, but we'll just have to see. All right. Yes, we've got a bunch of other questions there. Um, Hannah, you're welcome. Okay, so Nisha, I think we covered this. As far as the private-public partnerships, essentially it's a public college that then farms out some of the delivery of the curriculum of the school to a private college. So the private college is essentially getting um, their credential recognized or their, uh, they're, they're getting um, uh, residual kind of uh, credibility from the public institution, but they don't have to adhere to the same standards. And often the instruction at those schools is far less like, yeah, it, it just doesn't, it, the, the education that comes out of them, as the minister said, and as the department said, is just wanting. It's not good. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Ready? Subscribe to answer. That's great. Okay. Um, okay. So Aaron says, so that means international students can only qualify for masters in Canada. That is tough. No, it doesn't mean they can only qualify for masters. And we'll see this play out. It's just that masters and PhD will have more opportunities for bringing spouses or otherwise than, than, you know, than private colleges. And we'll see how it all plays out. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap this one up, you guys. Um, we've got a lot of questions. And uh, let's see here. Um, oh, Dishot, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I didn't see that there. You're very, very welcome. It looks like you're going to be okay. All right. Um, okay, and I'll just answer Raman's question here. Is postgraduate diploma equivalent to a master's degree? Um, no. You can't just assume because it's a postgraduate diploma that it's a master's degree. No. Let's see. Um, I think that's it. Most of the questions I see are, are kind of rehashing of the other ones. Um, uh, Christian says, how could it be possible that the spouse won't be able to work because of this restriction? 
If they're already in Canada, I'd like to think they're going to grandfather. But anyone who's submitting an application, brand new study permit, unless your master's PhD, you know, in that realm um, or whatever the the definition they have of a, a postgraduate uh, program, yeah, there's going to be large restrictions on spousal open work permits. All right, I think that is it, you guys. I think we should stop there. Um, yeah, thank you. And Vicky, thank you. This is very well said. Um, yeah, we've got a ton of questions that are still in there, but we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for for tuning in. I know this was a little bit later for some people uh, all over, but uh, yeah, I, I hope this was helpful. Stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. There will be any, the moment I get the pr program delivery instructions, we'll learn a whole lot more about this. Um, but uh, it's it's actually good news for people that are not in Canada and, you know, and, and people, well, I should say that are looking to apply through Express Entry. Not so good news for people who are applying for new study permits to Canada. It's horrible news for overseas education agents working for these private schools. It is, um, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of lukewarm uh, news for people that are already in Canada because I think to a large extent you're going to be grandfathered in. Um, but we'll see how it all plays out. All right, you guys. And thanks everybody for connecting in and we will see you guys <sighs> maybe tomorrow if they release it, right? Maybe tomorrow. We'll see how it all plays out. Okay, take care. Man, I say that a lot, don't I? I guess that's all we can do is see how it all plays out. <laughs> all right, let's wrap up with a little bit of tunes here. There we go. Thanks, Santa. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody else who's watching. Wouldn't be possible without all of you guys. Remember to subscribe. Take care.